And uh, as you know, what we do is we open it up over on YouTube. It's opened up for anybody to come and present arguments, to present topics for discussion, debate. I can't remember the last time we've had anybody actually come and debate, but that's okay. Uh, we can do whatever you guys want to do. Um, I don't know what's going on with the internet connection here. It's the upload speeds. Um, they've suddenly dr dropped drastically. So that was the problem that we had a few days ago. And it was after that power outage um, that kind of shocked the system. Uh, so I don't know if, but it seems to fluctuate. Like it's really strong at certain times, the upload speed, and then it's really weak. It just kind of wildly fluctuates. So um, it's going to, it's going to go up and down. So um, hopefully we can still make it work. You know what I'm saying? Make it twerk. And I had to go get a bunch of, you know, I basically replaced all the equipment and all that. So there's nothing more I can do on my end. It's not the fault of the devices. It's just for some reason, suddenly I've never had any problems. I've, I've been here for two years live streaming constantly and no problems. Now all of a sudden there's like intense difficulties with live streaming. So... Yeah, I mean, the audio should be fine. I don't know why the video... I mean, maybe I should just turn the video off and put up a picture or something. I mean, that's how we used to do it. Remember the back in the old Google Hangout days? Remember that? Um, so that's where we're at. What the heck is going on? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. But... Can y'all even see me? I don't even know. A nonsensical boomer excuse. It, it's not nonsensical. Literally, dude. I spent the whole week. Don't you think that if I do this for a living, that I go and spend a week trying to make this work better? I mean, you can see it fluctuating right now. Like, it goes from dropped to... I mean, I can try to turn off video. and We can put a picture up. Let's put up a pretty picture and see what happens. That ain't work. That ain't gonna work. Oh, that's music. That's not pretty pictures now. What if we do that? And then I turn off my video capture device. And let's see if that helps it any. Y'all can still hear me. You hear my beautiful voice. <clears throat> I know. I turned it down to 15 frames per second to make it work better. It's nothing nothing works so it has it's the upload speed you can go check the speed it fluctuates it drops it goes from nine to one and then back to nine and then back to one i mean it's just something is wrong and i've called him twice so it's 56k up in this mug so if we're not gonna have video I might as well just turn it off maybe it'll run a little streamer and smoother with with uh, no video issues what do you guys think I'll put a little uh, a little soy picture of me up there in the middle. Remember how we used to do it with Boiler Room? Remember that? When I would put the pictures in and out? How's that? And then we'll put a little thing of chalk up in there for y'all to remind you of how to desoyify yourselves. Surely that'll work. I mean, can we at least talk? Or is the internet going to shut they're gonna just. Sh I, I wonder if they're just messing with my shit, so I can't live stream. You know what I mean? I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I don't actually think that that's the case. I'm just joking, but it would be funny. I mean, we did have a storm, and then it hasn't worked since the storm. So uh, I don't know how many calls I can make to the internet men. <laughs> internet man, come and fix my thing, right? So. Uh, you guys can just be reminded of my one of my preeminent soy faces. That's a rare soy face NFT that literally goes for like 20,000 Ethereum. Or we can have choppy acid trip vision where I like five frames per second. 
Well, I'm sorry. I just don't think that you can see my facial expressions. I mean, even as it is, it's like still having a hard time working. It's just totally ridiculous. Like, I literally paid to have better internet connection. I'm paying like the top fee and I can't get standard basic bitch internet. I'm about to leave the CEO of internet a strongly worded letter. And where is everybody, by the way? Like, what the heck? Is it just nobody likes live streams on Wednesday nights? I don't understand. Uh, something's going on. There's a conspiracy to shut down my live streaming capabilities. Clearly. You can, of course, support us via Super Chats. There's the link for Super Chats. Um, and I know I'm, I'm behind on the people's Super Chats. Right? I didn't get to read no super chats because the internet quit working. Like it just basically there's a virus in the internet out there was what I think is going on. The internet's got the, the, the C virus and I don't have the answer, but welcome everybody. Hope you're having a beautiful time beautiful night as you know we usually open it up to anyone who has an objection has an argument they can bring their argument you have to bring an argument though that's the that's the rules here you can't uh, bring skeletons from my closet right you can't bring up anything that I ever did wrong that's not fair it's called debate cheating aka fallacies aka stuff I don't like you can't do that um, you can't uh, foul you can't do a technical foul you can't do anything that's not allowed in debate so you can have the floor if you want to make an argument I will give you the floor the way it works is you hit the request button and you can request to speak and I will have you on if you don't then I don't know you have to hit request to speak. And we had a, a, a adventurous day. I got to go to Nashville. Got to be on a uh, nice little fancy in studio interview on a, a video podcast in Nashville. That was fun. Had a good time. We had to get up early, go do that. Uh, I wouldn't. I, I would. I would like to mint my own NFTs. We're actually going to be doing that, bro, in the chat. So uh, I appreciate your idea but uh we are going to be doing that but yeah so it's this is like back to remember when we would do this like five years ago i would live stream and i would just do audio with the pictures still fun but i don't know um i've done everything i can for the live stream so we got a nice little intimate, cozy little chat here with uh, not very many people. I don't understand. Does nobody, what else is there to do on a Wednesday night other than try to pin me down? What else is there to do? I mean, it's a Wednesday night. You got, you can come debate me. Uh, what else is there? Did I have this on mute the whole time? Probably. But it doesn't matter because I can't even live stream anymore. Adam Crazy Crazy said for ten dollars this uh the debate streams three debate streams in three days. This is based in dire pill. Well thank you, man. Yeah, that's what that's what we aim for here is to be based in dire pill. Jonathan Dow for one dollar says, What is the biggest obstacle for laymen pursuing autodidactic theological study? The biggest obstacle is people doing it on their own and not doing it under the guidance of the church. Uh, and having a spiritual father. Is there a clear advantage to a hard copy or electronic medium? Uh, yeah, I think human beings aren't meant to read everything on stupid ass screens all the time. And it melts your mind. It turns your mind into uh, ramen noodles. So if you want ramen noodle brain, then read everything on, on the internet. Uh, or become a Bayes professor, man, and read on books, bro. Books, check them out. Books, check them out. Photo 
Rabdul, I can't even pronounce that name, dude. 10 bucks. Should people that were genetically modified be able to receive communion? Uh, yes, you can receive communion even if you are a mutant. <laughs> Any mutants can still, I, as far as I know, repent of their mutantism and they can still receive communion. Nick for three, but that's a great question. So, Toxic Avenger, bro, it's not too late. Turn your life around. Repent. Still, you can still, I mean, you will not get your appendages back. They've all turned to goo, but you can still be safe. Nick, $3. Are the Crusades good in the Orthodox view? Uh, no. The Latin barbarians sacked Constantinople in the 1200s. So, no way, man. They're not good. They're, they're bad. Uh... Could a holy or just war be a thing? Orthodoxy doesn't really have the idea of just war in the sense of the Roman Catholics or, or jihad. Holy war, jihad. Remember the witch in Dune? The voice from the outer world. Jihad. Now, uh, I mean, we believe in self-defense. There is, you know, the blessing and, and prayers for victory and these kinds of things. But also people who engage in battle end up uh, doing penance. So uh, there's also a penance for those that kill, even in Christian warfare, even if they do it for the, for the right reasons. And so, no Christian knights. That's kind of a uh, that's kind of a, a sassy, sassy little Roman Catholic thing. If you catch my drift, right? That's not an Orthodox thing. And there's a reason why clerics uh, don't take up the sword. That's forbidden in canon law. Someone who strides in to fight in defense of the faithful, that's different. That's the role of the state, right? So we don't have like warrior cardinals. Like, you know, that's, a, that's again, that's a weird me medieval Roman Catholic thing. And it's part of the, I would say, illustrious series of examples that you could use of the difference between Roman Catholic Christianity and orthodoxy, particularly after the first thousand years, right? Rome starts to do those very things. Brad, $5. Would you explain? No, wait, I'm sorry. I missed somebody. Adam Krejci, Krejci, five bucks. Uh, Father Andrew Damick's podcast partner is a UCC pastor. Yeah, I remember they used to, I don't know if he still does that podcast, but you're talking about that ecumenist dude. They all started coming after you and, uh, online orthodox father damick takes the side of the ecumenist evangelical over against anybody in orthodoxy online yeah that's what happened in 2018 19 unfortunately and so that kind of tell you tells you the direction of that dude brad five bucks just brad brad just sounds like a dude bro like he's brad is in a frat i can tell you that and he's just he did it that dude is so frat that he doesn't have a last name. He's just Brad. Brad? Yeah, Brad. So shout out to Brad from the frat. He's not even a frat that has a name, right? Like Alpha, Delta, Sigma, whatever. It's just it's just frat. Brad and frat. Would you please explain the Roman Catholic practice tiers, gradations, and segments? Um, there is no basis for forbidding children to partake of communion it's a roman catholic innovation my daughter is six and she wants to receive i feel that preventing this is harming her well you need to get out of the roman catholic church that's what's harming <laughs> that's the harmful thing you need to become orthodox and in the orthodox church your offspring will receive the sacraments because jesus said do not forbid the children to come to me varjar wave 777 i would love to debate the validity of SRA or satanic ritual abuse. Um, bro, the Twitter space link is linked. I mean, I don't know how many times I tell y'all every time I do this live stream and people, it's like people don't realize there's such a thing as a show description. There have always been show descriptions on YouTube and invariably people ask, where can I get your book? Where does your material go? What is your website? Where are the Twitter spaces? They're always linked in the show description. So if you want to debate, 
And I suppose satanic cults uh, exists under the domain of uh, the topics, atheism, Catholicism, Protestantism, Islam. I mean, a lot of the, uh, the satanic abuse has occurred in the domain of the Roman Catholic Church. So I guess that one would, that would fit under Roman Catholicism. So, bro, just come to the Twitter space, man. That's why it's there. The link is right there in the chat, dude. And, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to give you uh, a series of books, uh, articles by journalists. I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's books written by multiple psychiatrists, psychologists. So I don't know what you accept as a acceptable source, but, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to list them off and I mean the fact that you think that you want to debate that it's even real says to me quite a bit already so that would that's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting I'm sure so let's see we have one requester to speak he goes by the name of Father Deacon Dr. Ananias hello greetings how are you good Thanks for having me. Thank you. Glad you're here. I mean, uh, I just yeah, I just saw this popped up. I couldn't believe it on a Wednesday. Me doing a live stream? Yeah, when <laughs> that's unheard of. <laughs> you, what, what could you not believe? Well, no, just the Twitter, but it's it's worked out pretty good, so it kind of makes sense. I mean, you're always doing live streams. <laughs> I'm an R I am an IRL live streamer now, so now it's just you, you you follow me to the bathroom, you follow me to you know my closet. Yeah. I mean, it's you're with me all day now. What was that stupid show uh, on MTV like 15 years ago? Real World. Yeah, was it Real World? Where it just had the cameras on all the time. Oh, you know, like Big Brother. Yeah. Yeah. Dear God, brother. what a terrible idea. Yeah, isn't that terrible? Yeah, well, you're do Jay Dyer, Big Brother. Well, uh, you're welcome to join. Uh, so, would would you like to continue to discuss with whoever hops on? Yes, please. Uh, I'm just gonna ha I'm gonna have to do something with the internet, man, because like now it's just totally cut out. Uh, so, and then it pops back on, but like why there would be no upload speed is is mind boggling when it's been nine all week. So, I mean, some, it's something ridiculous here. All right. It seems, it seems yeah. good to me. I, I'm not getting. No, no, I'm talking on the live stream. I can't do video because there's, there's no, oh. there's no up. The oh, upload yeah. speed you, has died. You, right. I had a soy boy vampire. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Petty says for $10. Petty. Just unbelievable, really. Just just petty, really. I mean, that he would even stoop so low as to donate $10. I mean, really? That's petty. Just kidding. The name is Petty. $10. Thank you for all that you do. God bless. Well, thank you, Petty. I appreciate that. And you are not petty. You are a uh, special person. You're a stellar soldier. You're a starseed. Lamp by sea. Lamp by C. You have the microphone. Hello, Mr. Dyer. What's I up, hope dude? you can hear me okay. I can. Perfect. Um, one question for you is, I'm a Jewish man, and I have a close friend of mine that's Russian Orthodox, and we have an idea for a podcast in the next few weeks. He'll be kind of instructing me a little bit on Russian Orthodoxy, which I'm increasingly drawn towards. But part of that's going to be going to an actual Russian Orthodox service on Sunday. And I want to make sure that I'm respectful in, uh, I guess, being there as an observer. I, I'm, I don't think I can take communion, and I certainly wouldn't want to. Um, but I guess, is there any other advice you would give to somebody outside the faith who's never been to a Russian Orthodox church? Spin the dreidel in the middle of the service, in the floor. <laughs> I'm just being silly. Um, no, I, don't, I mean, it's not going to be that that weird or difficult if you've never... It, it'll be kind of new and surprising, obviously, if it's, a, if it's the first time that you go. But, uh, I mean, Father Deacon, you're the cleric. I would let you speak to that if you have a, any insight on uh, 
rubrics of, of a visitor for the first time? Um, nothing other than kind of wearing conservative and appropriate attire. Like, don't don't come in. Don't well, come Lam- in we know Lamp by the Sea. He was he was about to come up in there with some spandex. Right. Yeah, don't do a that. spandex bodysuit. The only thing, like, off the top of my head that I could think of that would like might rub people the wrong way. Don't wear your Daisy Dukes, bro. Come on. <laughs> Something I do in synagogue, and I guess kind of one one observation, and I have less of a question is that I'm increasingly dissatisfied with Judaism, and there is a massive trend within the religion to establish wide ranging sets of rules and then trying to circumvent them. So like there's an Aruf that goes around the entire island of Manhattan to religiously designate it a religious Mm. space. So Mm -hmm. Jews can go outside during Shabbat, which is, I mean, in in my view, absolutely heretical. And I even lived in Israel in a time and found that essentially, like, it seems as though no matter how Orthodox, Orthodox Jewish that you got, um, the entire kind of angle would be to try and circumvent these rules. That are prescribed, and I guess it's turned me very much off the religion. And my Russian friend has turned me uh, very, made me very interested in orthodoxy. He's a very, very humble, virtuous person. So I guess I'm not not really much of a question here. I guess I'm I'm kind of uh, interested in the religion and just trying to not be offensive. No, I don't think anybody's going to be offended. I mean, we're used to people coming in and debating and, and making whatever arguments they want, saying whatever they want. So, no, I, I welcome that. Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, in the New Testament, we see, well, actually, even in Jeremiah, we see Jeremiah actually criticizing in his day the tendency to uh, try to circumvent the revealed law through um, sort of made up traditions and made up laws. And then Jesus echoes what's in Jeremiah by saying the same thing in Matthew 23 to the Pharisees that really the whole point of the law gets subverted when it turns into this um, sort of almost a superstitious kind of thing. And, you know, I'm not super familiar with all the aspects of Judaism. I'm familiar with sort of the, the broad different takes from the reform Judaism to, you know, Orthodox Judaism to conservative Judaism to, you know, Hasidic and all that. Um, and, and it seems to me that it doesn't, you know, I mean, I, I understand there's differences, but really I think the emphasis is, uh, very, what am I trying to say? It does seem that there is a tendency to invent new laws or superstitions to get around or to, to keep things in some absurd sense and one of jesus criticisms is that the law was made for man not man for the law and so when you have the notion that the law is made that that man is made for the law it becomes uh something that paul says is kind of a thing that enslaves you so it doesn't become a liberating thing it becomes a, a thing that you know enslaves us to even the worst form of sin which jesus says is spiritual pride so if we are trusting in these sort of uh external ex, externals which the externals aren't bad but if we're trusting in external things at the same time as being you know in our inner man full of wickedness then it's even worse to be religious in that sense so does that make sense what i'm saying totally uh it reminds me of the fact that judaism doesn't have much of a concept of virtue and vice mm. and that through a lot of these prescribed rules it will kind of mandate essentially all these little rituals and observances that you have to do throughout the day in order to be devout devout or to be virtuous but i think i think increasingly i'm I'm dissatisfied with it um and i think it also christianity very much interests me because it has a concept of salvation it has concepts of grace and there are all these other little ideas in it that are just kind of shockingly absent in judaism yeah and um it creates there's there's a lot of problems with the religion yeah i would agree um i think that you could probably uh look at there's a really good book but i have a friend who's a messianic jew ken me and he wrote a book is jesus the messiah which is actually he just goes to the to the jewish texts and sources even even the talmud has these references that he found that were pretty pretty fascinating that kind of show that it doesn't seem to really make sense like the, the talmudic religion itself doesn't really make sense but 
Um, there's another good book too by uh, Surprised by Christ by Father Arnold Bernstein, who was a Orthodox Jew who became an Orthodox priest. So those are two good books. We have you know friends in our circle. So Michael Whitcoff uh, converted to Orthodoxy out of Judaism, and so his channel is Brother Augustine. If you're interested in uh, you know his take, he's got quite a few videos. He just did a live stream the other day on. Uh, book by Russian theologians. So yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I would look at typology too. I mean, I think one thing that's, that's a big element within Christianity that is a point of departure for Judaism is that we see a lot of what's in Genesis, you know, the prophets, the wisdom books, we see types. So we see images and predictors of Christ himself, especially things like, uh, predictions like Daniel nine, where you have, you know, the mention of, when the Messiah comes, the temple will, will be wiped away. It'll be destroyed. Um, you know, that will be a, a time of chastisement. He will bring in the everlasting sacrifice, which we think is the Eucharist. And so, you know, according to Daniel 9, when one of the signs when the Messiah is around or appears is that there will be the destruction of the temple and there won't be the animal sacrifices anymore. And that's connected to the promise in Genesis 49 that when Messiah comes, the Gentiles will look to him and the royal lineage in the house of david will cease so you know what do you know when jesus shows up you know within one generation of his preaching and ministry uh the the, uh, israel ends up you know destroyed after 70 a.d uh the temple is is removed and for us that's the meaning of the covenant being open to the gentiles and so that's how you would have texts like at the the end of isaiah you know there's these weird prophecies like isaiah saying that there will be gentile priests right like how is that even possible uh, you know, unless there's a sense in which the covenant eventually gets opened up to the Gentiles. So, you know, I think those are really powerful, in my view, proofs of Christianity. And it's fascinating because Judaism doesn't actually have many good refutations uh, that hold Jesus as the Messiah. It seems to mostly pivot down to the fact that somehow Israel as a nation wasn't elevated enough um, right. above the other nations, which is a very weak criticism. Other inconsistencies are that the Haredi Jews living within Israel don't speak Hebrew because they don't recognize the secular state of Israel mm. as being the eventual uh, right. res- you know, res- um, return. You know what I'm trying to say. And then right. it, it's there's also been cults within Judaism, such as the Lubavitcher Rebbe, right. which is where you'll have cults of Haredi that worship a messianic figure within their own religion, yeah. which once you get down to that, I mean, it's just, there's there's no real reason not to accept Jesus. And I can't say that I'm at that point yet, but I find it very, very interesting. And I'll right. keep working on that path. So Yeah, yeah, I check out those things I recommended. Yeah, stuff. check out Ken and Me's book, Is Jesus the Messiah? Check out the video that I did with Sam Shamoon, um, Messianic Prophecies. See what you think about that one. Um, I have a video I did on the book of Daniel, too. Um, and there's also Surprised by Christ by uh, Father Arnold Bernstein, who's an Orthodox priest. So I think you would like those. Thank you for the recommendation, sir. Yeah, man, great questions. Uh, good stuff there. Let's see who's. Was there a super chat? No. By the way, you can support the stream through the super chats. I'm not sure why we have. I guess uh, I'm I'm getting deep. So there's 7,000 people watching Vouch and 140 people watching this. I mean, guys, come on. This is ridiculous, right? I mean. Come on. (laughs) Like, that guy is, like, unbelievably preposterous so you know if that guy is beating me i don't i don't think it's my fault like at that point i'm gonna say no it's not this is not me something else, like the whole culture is just i don't know lost their mind or something that guy's just that guy's off i get it i mean wow right that guy's a total goblin uh, I, maybe I'm being shadow banned. I mean, I, I know that on, I know I am shadow man on Instagram, but who cares about Instagram? But, um, anyway, you can support through, uh, super chats by using Streamlabs. Of course we were demonetized last year on YouTube. So you can still, uh, super chat there. There's another, yeah. So we got some people wanting to chat. Who's up next is punished. I can't see the full name punished somebody. What's up? punished you're not punished we love you 
Uh-oh, Reformed Dweeb is in the house. Uh-oh, so we got a uh, we got an Anglican interlocutor coming as well. So I've invited him a couple times because he's an Anglo-Calvinist, I think. So he wants to come discuss, and I've told him that, w- that he could when he's available. But first up was Catholic reactionary. Excuse me. I thought it said something else. Go ahead, dude. You got the mic. Yeah, so um, um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. I want to try and so I don't know if it's the audio is messed up or anything. No, you're good. I had a few questions. One of them was about, um, I often hear, I remember speaking to you on Discord a while ago and I asked you a question about whether or not you think um, Catholic sacraments are valid. And you said that that concept does sort of, doesn't sort of exist in orthodoxy. And I was sort of, and I, and, I, and I see things like that, like saying like, this sort of concept doesn't exist in orthodoxy as well. You there? You're cutting out. Are you there? Talk about like more than Benny Nielsen. You're cutting out, bro. Yeah, cutting out. You want to try to come out and come back in? But it seems. Try to come out and come back in. It seems to me that like. We're not getting any of, of your audio. Can you even hear us? No. We're... Like, would we Orthodox view Roman Catholic sacraments as valid? And he thought you had said in the Discord, um, we don't have a concept of that. We do have a concept. Well, it sounded like that's where he's going, but yeah, I couldn't really tell where he, But uh, Reformed Dweeb, what's up, man? Hey, what's up, dude? Uh, so thanks for inviting me. I, just sure. had, uh, I actually just had a couple questions. Okay. So... I was wondering, I, I hear a lot of uh, Orthodox people talk about like the mo- the monarchy of the Father, and I was wondering if you could kind of help me better understand that. Right, so in our theology, in, in contrast to tendencies in the West, which are pretty prevalent, we don't begin with the speculations about who God is or his attributes in terms of the unity of his essence. doesn't mean that we deny the unity of God's essence, but for us... Of course. The primary reason that we think there's, quote, one God or the reference to the one God is the person of the Father. And that's because not only is it sort of the Cappadocian dogma, but it's the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed dogma, right? For us, there's one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And then when it describes the Son and the Spirit, it says God from God, light from light. So the, the Ordo Theologia, the starting point for us is person and not nature. So persons have nature, but nature or essence can't be the theological starting point to sort of determine our system. And most Western theology after Augustine does begin uh, its theologizing or its ordo theologiae by predicating attributes to the essence. And we think that's wrongheaded first and foremost, because as St. Gregory Palamas says to Barlium in the debate, uh, he did not say, I am it right in uh, exodus three fourteen, he said i am in other words i am he so it's a statement of divine personhood it's not a statement of it's not an essentialist metaphysic that we start with and a lot of especially in the in the medieval latin west you get scholastics who kind of go crazy with it and they kind of just engage in just n- incessant uh, speculations about predicating of the divine essence and it just kind of gets ridiculous ultimately it comes modalistic right so basically the triad is sacrificed for the monad in a lot of western theology especially with the Thomistic conception of absolute divine simplicity um, it just results in all these mistakes and it's because there was never in the west an adherence to constantinople one uh in the long term i'm not saying they reject it because in in theory the western churches you know, Roman Catholics, Protestants, in theory, they'll say, oh yeah, we agree with the Cappadocians and Constantinople I. But I mean, the fundamental doctrine of the Cappadocians at, at the Council of Constantinople I is the monarchy of the father. It's all of the Cappadocians teach it. And so we believe that the property that picks out the person of the father, his hypostatic property is to be the sole cause, the monarche, the fountain, the principle without principle, the anarche, uh, the sole source. These are all phrases and terms used by the Cappadocians to pick out the person of the Father. And that's 
precisely why we could never accept filioque because how can the son have the, the father's unique hypostatic identifier or property okay all right thanks i i, I think i oh can you can you guys hear me I yeah think I, I think i might be lagging a little no bit. i can hear you all right cool 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 no thanks man uh that definitely helps clear some things up i just i did want to say like does that mean that you guys kind of hold do not not like the this like like the eternal subordinationism not nothing like that but like would that mean that there is some form of subordination within the godhead yeah, I mean, if you read Athanasius, he teaches very clearly, as well as Nicaea, that the Son derives his existence and his origin from the person of the Father. That's what the meaning of that's what the meaning of eternal begetting is. And so, okay. so being, the Father being the cause in this, the Son, does not imply any uh, subordination or, or metaphysical subordination. It implies a uh, subordination or in terms of order or in terms of origin. So Basil says. Just because the son has his origin in the father does not mean that he ontologically lacks any power or uh, or that he's not homoousius with the father. Right, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I know you guys aren't like trying to preach like a weird form of tritheism, but I guess, I, I guess I've guess i just been raised in the Western tradition with the sure. co-equal, co-eternal, so, you know. Well, we, but, we do affirm co-equal and co-eternal because the eternal begetting is an eternal uh, right, o- originating it's not a temporal thing so right, right. eternal be- yeah, yeah, eternal yeah. begetting is the doctrine of athanasius and nicaea and his right. his doctrine is that the father is the sole source in the godhead so you can't make you can't make the essence of god the source because the essence doesn't do person does persons act not essences persons with essences act but it doesn't make any sense to say that the essence generates or the essence spirates, right? Because the essence of God is common to all three persons. And so if the Holy Spirit has the essence, then it, would, it, it wouldn't work to say that possessing the essence is what gives you uh, the ability to cause. Because then the Holy Spirit would be his own source. Right, and that would just be kind of weird. Um, right, and the Calvinist Calvinists believe that the Son has existence of himself. So Calvin is one of the first in church history to deny the eternal begetting of the Son and, and teach that the Son is uh, autotheos. I mean, I, I, I don't deny the eternal begetting of the Son. I don't know if that means I'm not technically a Calvinist, but I'm, I mean, I, I definitely want to affirm at the very least the eternal beginning of the sun and the procession of the spirit i don't deny eternal generation well the only right the only way to have that is to believe that the father is the sole cause because i mean what else would be the source what else would be the source of the son and the spirit other than the father it, it can't well, no, I, it I, can't I, be the I, essence and like i said i don't deny eternal generation i i don't i just i don't i don't know that the I also. That, well, that well, what I'm saying, us. right? I'm not trying to be rude or cut you off, but what I'm saying no, is that good, if man. you if you don't deny eternal generation, that necessitates the Father as the sole cause. The two doctrines okay. go together. Okay. So, and then I I also had another question about yeah. uh, essence and energies. Sure. Could you could you maybe sort of break down the essence energy distinction? Because I, like I said, I'm trying to better understand Orthodox theology, and that has always confused me a bit as well. Right. So, uh, if you look at the Old Testament, we have, for example, the situation where it says that no man can see God and live, and yet we're told that Moses went up on the mountain and he saw God face to face. So uh, we have an apparent contradiction, but it's not a contradiction if we understand that the way that Moses saw God face to face was number one. Not that he saw the person of the Father, because Christ says no man sees the Father at any time. And yet in John 5, he argues to the Pharisees that Moses did see God, quote-unquote, on the mountain. And so how did Moses see God and who did he see? Well, according to Jesus' argumentation there, he saw the person of the Son. He said, he said Moses, right, I was talking to Moses. He says, Abraham rejoiced to see me. And yeah, that's, be- that's yeah, because the, yeah, 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 yeah. the theophanies in the Old Testament are the second person of Godhead. So right. how is it that a theophany manifests? And because, right, in the Roman Catholic debates in the Middle Ages, it becomes a created uh, hologram, basically, a, a created form. 
And we don't believe that it's a created form because you can't worship created forms. You can only worship God, and yet the theophanies are called God and are worshipped as God. And the theophanies, the theophanies are no different than when Jesus is transfigured in Matthew 17, the light of glory shines through his humanity. So the answer to this uh, actually precedes Paul. I mean, it's mentioned, we would say, in the Old Testament, many places where you have these theophanies, where you have the glory cloud, when you have manifestations of the divine form, the divine word, the angel of the Lord. These are all energetic manifestations because they can't be the divine essence because no, just like no one can see the Father, no one can see or, or give or grant the divine essence or nature any form. So what can be seen or known? Well, it has to be personal energies that reveal the triad, in particular, the second person of the triad is who is revealed in these theophanies. Uh, and so, uh, you know, and then in, in Pentecost, of course, the third person is revealed b- via the tongues of fire. And we think that's also an energetic manifestation, right? Because the Holy Spirit's not a dove. He's not fire. But those are manifestations that are energetic in the sense that they're distinct from the essence of God, but they are really divine actions, attributes, or operations. So when Paul, for example, talks about the uh, works of God, he calls them the inner Gaia, right? He says in 1 Corinthians that the works of the Spirit are the gifts of the Spirit, and he calls them the energies of the Spirit. And then in New Testament, or excuse me, in the patristic era, we have uh, many situations where the church fathers end up debating this and explaining it. Uh, all of the Cappadocians make the essence centered distinction. It's, it's crucial to their, uh, both their Christology, uh, excuse me, their triadology and their Christology. And ultimately it becomes uh, clarified by Cyril in terms of the Eucharist. Uh, Cyril uses the essence centered distinction to explain how the Eucharist is our participation in the deified flesh of Christ. And he explains that it is the uncreated energies that Christ communicates to his human nature to deify it. And thus that's the same uh, deified flesh that we partake of in the Eucharist. So another example would be in Philippians or first Thessalonians, where Paul talks about the power of God, the dunamis or the energies of God at work in him. And he says, so it is Christ at work in me. It is his power, his dunamis at work in me. And so we would say that the only way to really understand grace or the participation in um, the life of God is that it, you, we can't be participating in the divine essence. We can't be participating in uh, the actual literal hypostasis. So it has to be a grace that God grants us um, that is fully God and yet in another in another sense distinct from God in his inner essence or being. And so that's why there's a distinction between essence and energy. A great example would be the glory that Jesus said he came to give us a share in. So he says that we would be made partakers, sharers in the glory in John 17 that he had with the Father before the foundation of the world. So if everybody agrees that we don't partake of the divine essence, and if we understand that God's glory isn't created, it's obviously uncreated. In fact, 1 Timothy 6 identifies it as an immortal light, an immortal glory that God dwells in then what he communicates to us in salvation has to be an uncreated grace distinct from his essence and thus the essence energy distinction. So you'll see this in, for example, St. Basil's letter 234. Uh, you'll see it in Athanasius when he rebu- when he refutes the Arians to distinguish actions in God proper to nature uh, as opposed to actions proper to counsel and will. So in other words, creating the world is an energetic uh, work of will. The generating the, of the sun is not a work of will. It's a direct offspring of the Father's nature, Athanasius argues against the Arians. And we see it in um, triadology as well, Basil on the Holy Spirit. He argues that one way that we can know that the Holy Spirit has uh, equal divinity with the Father and the Son is that he has the exact same energies as the Father and the Son. And so if energy signifies essence and the Holy Spirit has the same energies as the Father and the Son, then he must have the same essence as the Father and the Son. That's the, one of the central arguments of Basil's on the Holy Spirit. Uh, we see it throughout Gregory Nazianzus's or, theological orations, uh, especially the ones on the Holy Spirit and the Son. And so, you know, it's just a, it's so fundamental to the Cappadocians and to Cyril that you know Roman Catholics. And I'm not trying to knock you know knock you or anybody in the West. It's just uh, really it's just unknown. Really, is that people just don't know how prevalent this doctrine is in the Eastern Fathers. Um, and then it's clearly, it's every, it's everywhere in St. Maximus. I mean, he talks about it all the time. It's, it's fundamental to his Christology and that's why it becomes, uh, 
really, and you could say paradigmatic for the Sixth Council, because the Sixth Council's diophysite and uh, dio, uh, uh, diophilite, right? diophilite is predicated on there being two wills and two energies, which, re- right. which, which requires an essence energy distinction in Christ. Wait, wait, you said, hold on, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, let me make sure I've got this. You said, so because Christ has two natures and two wills, there must be a distinction between essence and energies. I, I don't think I, I was following you up until that point, and then I think you kind of lost me. Well, the Sixth second. Council actually teaches two natures, two wills, and two operations or energies, and the word that's used is energies. I see. I see. Okay. Sorry so, in that. other words, the operation or energy of Christ walking on water uh, is a distinct operation or energy from His creating the world. Those are two distinct actions. And th- okay. thus, that right there refutes the doctrine of actus puros. Okay, so I just had um, I just had one more uh, sure. question. So, how would you respond to? Well, I guess it's kind of two questions. But how would you respond to someone in the West saying, "Well, Peter," sa- and I'm not saying I would use this argument, but Peter says that we'll become partakers in the divine nature, and that. Um, what, what is it? What was the other one? That the essence energies distinction creates accidents in God. How would you respond to those objections, I guess? Right. So St. John Damascus responds to the second objection, and he notes that the energies are not accidents. They are fully divine, just as much as the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are not accidents to the divine essence. So the actions or energies of God are not accidental. They are just as much God as the persons are God. So uh, this Barlium raises that objection and St. Gregory Palamas says the same way that, that the divine nature is fully present in each of the persons. So likewise, the divine nature is fully present in every one of the actions because they're actions of the divine persons. So in the same way that if I, the, to use the Cappadocian analogy, if I build a house, it's my human energy that is going into building the house. Building a house is proper to human energy human power and human nature it's something that humans do to or identical to the action of doing that and the way that i prove that is that again it is absurd and self-refuting to say that the action of creating the world is identical to the action of walking on water both of which are identical to the action of destroying the world in the conflagration i mean but that's literally what actus purus would lead us to in that reductionistic sense so okay so you you said Okay, so I. I and what was the, hold on? What was the what was the first question? I, for, I forgot the first oh, objection. Yeah, the first one was uh, someone might say like Peter says that we'll become oh, partakers right. of the divine nature, not the divine. Right. Energy, so the word like the, the word there can refer to partakers of divinity or divine life, and that can the, the word God or the word divinity can pick out different things. So sometimes it might be picking out an energy. Sometimes it might be picking out. A divine person or sometimes it might be picking out the divine it's a it's not a what's called a rigid designator no the word god can pick out different things it doesn't always reference just the divine essence or just the father it can pick out the sun it can pick out a divine operation or an energy it can even pick out angels or demons right the, it's not a proper name right, right. so right. likewise the way that we can quote partake of divinity is similar to becoming gods the way jesus says that i've said you are all gods well, God, in what sense? Well, the way that we become a partaker of the divinity or the divine nature is via the energies. But just because it says divine nature does not mean it's identical to the notion of the usia, the divine essence. Right. Okay. That makes sense. Um, I did want to just jump back to the last point real quick. Sure. You, you said that the energies are themselves fully divine, but they're distinct from God's essence. Right. So they're, they're, they are not essential to him. Doesn't that make them accidents? Like I, I no, I guess because I'm only if you have only only if you have the presupposition of Aristotelian metaphysics. Okay, so then what 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 sort of metaphysical framework or does the Eastern Church sort of work in, or is the there Bible you biblical are? revelation? So the 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 revelation tells us that God uh, can never be seen or known in essence but that he does manifest in time and space. So we're going to take the theophanies as the paradigm that determines our metaphysic, not the other way around. And that's okay. why every heretic and every Roman Catholic says that biblical theology must submit to Aristotelian presuppositions. And I'm showing that that's self-refuting because if 
God is reducible to, in his essence, pure act, then there's no possibility for an incarnation. There's no possibility for God doing different things. Because pure act means there's no potentia. It means that anything that God does, he does of necessity. And it also means that that being can't incarnate. An absolutely simple essence cannot enter into time and space because it would, it would necessitate him altering or undergoing change. Likewise, the creation ex nihilo is impossible if God is pure act. And, and, okay. and God can't do different things. He's only one act. Pure act means always only perpetually willing his own essence, according to Latin theology as to what pure act means. Right. But what, what I said earlier, if you, where, where does the scripture say that God cannot be seen in his essence? I understand that like, like not like ever, like what, what was the passage that you quoted for that? There are a bunch of passages, right? So for example, we have the prohibition about making any images of the divinity. Paul says in Acts 17, the divine nature is not like anything created like uh, gold, silver, or idols, or stone, right? So there's a sense in which uh, the divinity cannot be imaged or pictured. And yet at the same time, there's a sense in which the divinity can be pictured. So how is that possible and in what sense? And so uh, Orthodox theology is apophatic in the sense that we don't think that any word, term, or concept can define or encapsulate what is the divine essence and so how do we know god then well god reveals himself to us in a mode that is distinct from his essence and that's what the energies are they're they're the mode by which god reveals himself to us and we believe that not because of philosophical speculation but on the basis of divine revelation the fact that we're told even in the old testament that no man can see or uh, make an image of the divinity or the divine essence and yet at the same time Moses saw God. Who did he see? The sun. Okay. And that's that, ma that ma mode of the sun becoming incarnate by which he reveals himself to us is an energetic manifestation. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thanks, man. I, I appreciate it. I actually have to get going. My phone's about to die, but okay. I, I do appreciate you inviting me on, man. Sure. Let me speak. Yeah, great questions. I would, if you want a good book on that, uh, Dr. David Bradshaw's book, Aristotle East and West, uh, goes very deep into the questions that you're asking. All right. Thanks, man. Uh, could you say that title one more time? You'll break it up. Aristotle East and West by Dr. David Bradshaw. Thanks, man. I'll, uh, I'll catch you later. Appreciate sure. it. Yeah, good questions. Uh, Thanks, man. Yeah, that guy was saying he wanted to come on for a good while now. So, whoa. We have like seven requests. When do we ever get seven requests? Uh, and of course it's when the internet doesn't work right. So I guess I'm going to have to call spectrum for the 10th time. I mean, I've called them like so many times. It's crazy. Um, well, I actually, there's a problem. I call God. I have a God hotline whenever my, it's uh, really pious back. of you. That's really <laughs> fine. <laughs> um, I want to remind you guys too, that of course the show sponsor is, uh, our based bros over at chalk.com. Chalk is the best source for organic supplementation they are fiends when it comes to purity and purity uh, levels in their product the same way that the germans have the purity laws for the beer no it's even better with chalk they have like they have eugenic level laws for their uh for their supplementation so head on over to chalk.com and use the promo code j50 there's also the lifetime code where you can get like you know the the consistent deliveries each week each month however you want to set it up so they also have that and if you want that discount it's j53 life j53 life is the lifetime discount but if you just want to check it out for a week use the promo code j50 they have supplements for all of your needs guys and girls if you want to boost that testosterone you want that tonka Lee, you want to you want to focus your mental clarity you want the she legit you just want an overall booster you want the daily they've got it all mountain walk sends 51 dollars and 69 cents what is your favorite arnold movie well there's a bunch i mean there's so many there's a few you know really good movies that arnold's in there's a few just ridiculous movies that Arnold's in. So it's kind of like a tie between the good ones and the horrible ones. Uh, I think Jingle All the Way is so bad that it's really enjoyable. And a uh, big fan of Total Recall. I think Total Recall is a lot of fun. So those are a couple Arnold's that come to mind. 
Who's your favorite philosopher? Uh, honestly, I don't really have a favorite philosopher. Father Deacon Ananias. Yeah, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias is my favorite. I mean, there's so many bad worldly philosophers, uh, and they're all kind of in the same boat. I mean, they're in, they're, there's a kind of a scale because, you know, some are better than others, but when it comes to secular philosophers, I mean, they're just kind of like, eh, they're all kind of the same. But well, you know, my students ask me that same question. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "What are we five years old?" That's like asking, "Like, what's your favorite color?" What's your? I'm like, I thought when we got older, we got a bit more nuanced. <laughs> and so it's like, okay, well, first let me just state that. <laughs> right. And exactly. that I enjoy still reading philosophers and like them, but in different ways. Some are enjoyable to read. Right. Some are right about some stuff. Um, some are right about and, and good and important in certain areas. So yeah. it's really hard to say, like, right. can you just have a blanket statement of, like, what's my favorite? It's like, well, it depends what I'm doing yeah. and what I'm researching. or You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's orthodox philosophers who are good. Uh, and so in regard to orthodox theology, I like orthodox philosophers. So I like, you know, David Bradshaw, people like that. When it comes to philosophy in general, I mean, I, there's a lot of things I appreciate in Aristotle, things I appreciative for not being. Oh, you were and now you're not. Well, that's great. Hey, shout out to Mountain Walk. Uh, really good news. Glad to hear that. And by the way, he gives you a shout out for the deacon. He says, I hope you and your family are well. Shout out also to Father Deacon. So uh, Mountain Walk is a fan also of your apologetic, apparently. Wonderful. Thank you. Guys, I want to remind you, too, uh, after tonight's uh, live stream, Jamie is premiering her new episode tonight, too. So you can go watch over on her channel the premiere of uh, her episode two of her podcast that she she's doing with her friend Kristen. So go check that out over on her channel. Dave says for three dollars, how do you reconcile the genealogies of Jesus, gospel and Matthew and Luke? Uh, I would just go, say go read the article over at Apologetics Press. There's a good one on that. Um Although I think that website might have gone down, so you might have to use the Wayback Machine. But uh, that's my recommendation. And most study Bibles, the Orthodox Study Bible, for example, they'll give explanations of the uh, the differences relating to. I assume you mean like Mary and and what and who is uh, Mary really? How does she? How is uh you know? In other words, we have the assumption that, for example, that Mary is a descendant of David as well. Uh, so that's how Jesus is a still a descendant of David. The bloodlines uh, are from Joseph. Yeah, go read that essay over at Apologetics Press. Um, the name. So, shouldn't the bloodline come from Mary? Not if Joseph is Mary's guardian, and if Joseph is also from the house of David. Uh, the names of Joseph's father don't match up when others are compared. Uh, sometimes people have two names, so that's another uh, way to understand that. So. Yeah, I mean, there's also copyist errors as well, right? So, I mean, we don't believe that the existing manuscripts uh, in various codices are infallible in the sense of, like, they can have copyist errors. So somebody might have written down the wrong name or the wrong name or somebody else's name in a section like that or the wrong number of soldiers or something like that. And it doesn't affect inspiration or inerrancy because really inerrancy is the purview of the autographa that Paul himself wrote or the gospel writers themselves wrote. So we do acknowledge copyist errors. Uh, if you want an example of that, go listen to the interview that it would, uh, with James snap, um, kingdom kid, $5, Dr. Justin sledge who does Judaism is steeped in mysticism and magic. And the Bible doesn't say that you can't practice these things. Uh, I would beg to differ. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, it says in several places that you can't practice those things. In fact, it even uh, assigns in Leviticus, you know, some pretty stiff penalties as well as in Deuteronomy for the practice of those things. Um, the New Testament also uh, is very clear that sorcery and, and the uh, divination are condemned practices. So, no, we, we, we don't believe that you can do those things. Is it wrong as a Christian to watch a show like The Witcher or Harry Potter because of the magic element? Uh, I think magic, magical realism, and these kinds of d literary devices can be used fine, but uh, we have to be really grounded in a good worldview. Um, so I've, never, I've watched, I think, a few episodes of The Witcher. I don't really have much of an opinion on that. 
Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Harry Potter. I don't really have any opinion on it. I've seen them, but um, I, I suppose it's potentially they could be gateways as well. But if you're grounded in your worldview, then you're not going to be swayed by reading Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or even Harry Potter in terms of like them lit- really getting you into magic. I don't think. I don't think those are uh, real dangers, but... I think that there is a real danger by thinking that you're going to get power uh, by engaging in occult practices, and actually, it can just drive you to insanity. I mean, you you'll, you'll, you can be, or worse, you can you can be possessed. So, I would stay away from the practice of it, but I don't see a problem with it as a literary device. Coolio, twenty bucks. Al Gore has canceled you, bro. I don't know. It, no, I'm like 99% sure that when I was doing that live stream five days ago and the power went out, remember that, how it went out at the end? Uh, ever since then, the internet has been messed up. So I don't know what it is. It doesn't have anything to do with download speed. It's literally all upload speed. I, I don't know why. I can't. The technicians have already come out here. I've replaced the modem and the router. I mean, I don't know what else to do other than to keep bugging them. So, but... Uh, or maybe it is just Al Gore somehow canceling me. Day Jai or $1. Are you a music buff? Well, of course. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm listening to music all the time. What are your thoughts on Frank Zappa? I am not a huge Frank Zappa fan. Uh, I mean, I've heard, I don't know, in my life, maybe five Frank Zappa songs. Uh, it's not really my cup of tea. Although I do like some really weird avant-garde experimental types of music. So... Uh, I like some, you know, really weird David Bowie, Radiohead kind of stuff that's like that. Uh, I'm not a huge Radiohead, David Bowie fan. I'm just saying that I do like some of that kind of stuff, but just not really into Frank Zappa. Um, the closest thing to Frank Zappa that I've always been a fan of would be They Might Be Giants, I guess. Parker, $5. Why is the Immaculate Conception not work in orthodoxy uh because it's tied to the augustinian doctrine of original sin uh the idea of the passing on of a taint of original sin which has connotations of manichaeanism we would say and because uh mary fell asleep so the feast of the dormition um is precisely why she is a son of adam and she does experience the effects of adam's sin although she herself was by grace preserved from sin so there's no need to have the Immaculate Conception Doctrine in Orthodox theology, although there have been some Orthodox people, I think, who have had that opinion. It really just doesn't, isn't necessary unless we have uh, the Augustinian conception of what's going on in original sin and how it's transmitted. There's a really good uh, thing that Craig Trulia did. If you want to go look at Craig Trulia's um, talk, I think he did a talk and a big, long essay on that, so... Uh, so now the stream, look, the stream went from zero to excellent. It's just like wildly jumping up and down. So if anybody has any like internet knowledge, if you can tell me why it would be that after the storm, I mean, like a, it was a mild, like a cut storm, dude, like a soy boy level storm. And then the internet just goes nuts. So you call Spectre. Yeah, maybe I would get it. It's those Ruski dirty bombs that they're dropping in your. It's probably Klaus. Klaus is like, Cut off the internet. Close down his servers. Uh, that's what I get for making Klaus and Gilbate jokes. Now, now I can't live stream. Um, let's see who's next. Clown World, what's up? Clown World, did you want to have the mic? <clears throat> uh, yeah, this uh, near me. Yo. Yep. How's it going? Um, so I was just had a question about um, what do you think about the majority of kind of the spiritual sickness and degeneracy that we're experiencing today? Um, do you think that it might have originated, like a significant majority of it might have existed kind of in the era of, of around 2000, I think 2011 with the new atheism with people, you know, via internet and social media uh, the ideas that you know our society can somehow thrive and still be moral and people have a sense of purpose by merely throwing out basically 2,000 year old traditions of Christianity um, 
you know, even if they think they're right, um, it seems like to me like they weren't very forward looking enough to predict the problems uh, that uh, could have uh, been exacerbated, like period uh, you know, feelings that people have of meaninglessness, drug use, suicide. Um, uh, you know, I understand also that made, probably many of their arguments have been put forth decades ago by other people, but uh, I think this was the first time that it was ever put forth to such a large audience via the internet. Um, I was just wondering what you think, um, what kind of negative impact this has had. Um, do you think the seeds for this kind of problem were sown um, much earlier, or do you think that this was probably the most significant shift in this kind of worldview? Um, you know, what kind of damage do you think this has done overall to society just in the past 15 years or so? That's all I had. Uh, tremendous, and I think that the digression gets faster and faster. I think that's the surprising part to me is that how fast the digression into oblivion occurs <laughs> like yeah i would have thought it would be a lot slower and it would take you know oh yeah in 10 years from now they'll do this and then 10 years from then then they'll do this and now it's like lightning speed within like you know what would have been unheard of uh 10 years ago is the norm now and you know in five years it'll be even crazier if we don't repent but i mean yeah that's what's really interesting is if you look back in history it usually takes couple decades yeah for people to radically switch moral positions and as jay said that what's so surprising is like um just in the last decade people switch and within a year and then what's even crazier is that it's just all getting faster I'd say in the we've seen the last month is like people literally switch positions within a day, like radical positions. Um, and it's just getting faster and faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah people- I, mean, I, I was just going to say like one of the things that I noticed is the, um, it, it seems like those people should have been, you know, even if they don't believe in Christianity or whatever, you know, if, even if they think that they're right, I think that they should have at least been kind of forward thinking to think, to understand like what you just take away 2000 years of tradition or something that has held the glue that held society together for so long that there's just nothing to uh, hold it together. Right. And they, they should have at least known that this could have such uh, disastrous ramifications, but maybe they just never thought about it like that. I don't know. I think they're put in there. I mean, these popular atheists, they're uh, pop thinkers. Yeah. And um, they're propped up, I think, by the elites who have kind of a bigger plan of kind of deconstructing the fabric of society. So it's not that these people were just like academics that came up and developed these positions. Um, And Jay would know a lot about this too. I think they're purposely put in there. Um to do these things i never thought about it like that maybe they're almost like the the forcing of like transgender story time in the schools in a way like they're they're sort of like people that have just put there to kind of break down uh society a little bit or to you know give people kind of no direction or just lead people astray i guess or you know just create chaos yeah exactly did you have any more? Do you have, do you have the any instruments more? and actors of the social engineering plans mm-hmm. of the elites is kind of my idea. Did you have any other questions you want to get to? Uh, no, I just you know, that was just kind of a, I just kind of wanted your thoughts, or both your girls' thoughts, really on that because that was something I was just thinking about today as I was driving. I was just kind of like, yeah, I mean, um, regardless, you know, even if those guys are uh let's just say that they're right you know that's it's uh it's pretty foolish i think to push you know to 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 open pandora's box like that and just uh, you know destroy everybody's uh beliefs and you know give people just this sense of meaninglessness i think what is that guy's theraphim rose that wrote some book about nihilism yeah father seven rose it's a classic we recommend it a lot 
I read I read some of that. It, it's kind of it's kind of a tough read, <laughs> but um, I don't know if you had anything to say about that book in particular as it pertains to what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's totally relevant. Probably one of the most relevant. I did a whole uh, I think a two hour talk on that book. So get and go watch that uh, that video that we did on that. How, how do I see that talk? I just it's on YouTube. Okay. Is it just under your? Is it Jay Dyer? Yeah, Jay Dyer, comma nihilism, comma Sarah from Rose, and hopefully it'll come up. You might have to scroll back on my YouTube channel. I don't know. Okay, we will have to check that out. Thanks. Yeah, man. Thank you. Good question. All right. Uh, we got all kind of people trying to trying to talk tonight. Johnny Utah. That's a good name from. Uh, Old Kinko Reeves. Whoa. Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, nice. What's up? Yeah, you might have answered this earlier, um, but I'm just curious why Catholics have such an issue with Palmas. Um, I keep reading a bunch of articles from them mentioning that there's that there are division, um, and I guess that's a huge issue for them. Do you have anything on that? They. What did you say? They argue tradition. No, they, they argue that, that uh, Palamas is claiming that there are divisions with uh, because of the essence energies distinction. Um, do you know why Catholics would think that? Why they they would say that they're that well? Yeah, Palamas they, ha- is they have they have a they have a dogmatic doctrine of absolute divine simplicity, which argues that real distinctions necessarily entail composition, division, or separation. And of course, they're totally inconsistent on that because they believe that the Father and the Son are really distinct, and yet they don't think that that entails composition. And so they then turn around and say, but if God's actions are distinct from his essence, then that entails composition or division. So um, it's just bad philosophy, bad misunderstanding, bad theology, bad Trinitarian theology. It, it's all rooted in they have a presupposition about metaphysics that then they squeeze divine revelation into. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and by the way, they're not consistent. Yeah, they're not consistent because they have a whole group called Uniates who believe that he's a saint and a church father. Oh. Okay. So, I mean, you know what you know what Uniates are, right? No. Eastern no. Catholics. You don't know what Eastern Catholics are? Uh, no, I'm kind of new to all this. Okay. So, uh, Palamas was a heretic for centuries, except that Eastern Roman Catholics say he's a saint and now he's a saint and the Vatican says, okay, he's cool now. So. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. I had just one other random question. I know you have some issues with Damick, uh, which from some of your Twitter uh, stuff that I've seen seems pretty justified. Uh, what do you think of Stephen DeYoung? I don't know Father DeYoung, but I mean, he uh, has done many podcasts with people in our circles, so I don't have anything but good thoughts and uh, things to say about him. Cool. Yeah, I just bought a book of his, so I wanted to kind of check that out. But yeah, that's all I got. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, good questions. Uh, let's see. Next up is uh, Evan. What's up, Evan? Evan? Hey, how's it going, Jay? So, I have a few questions, but I know you recommended a political book by a Russian guy called Konstantin Pobedomontev. I don't know. His name is weird. Yeah, but, that's it. But um, basically, I was curious about, you know, uh, and also Aquinas. So... Theoretically, could a form of orthodoxy, you know, related to democracy or democratic system uh, work without the idea of symphony? I had a conversation with a, um, a bishop. I go to Greek church, though. Um, but he basically said, oh, well, Protestants aren't good because they involve kind of like a boomer thing. Like he said, Protestants aren't good because they involve religion with politics, which I thought was kind of absurd. But then he talked about Symphonia being good and stuff like that. It was very kind of like, I, I don't know how to say it. It's like a cognitive should be politically active in order to promote the good or like, um, you know, to, to pass things that 
are beneficial to society within the Christian paradigm? Well, yeah. I mean, the idea of symphonia requires that the state operate on Christian principles. So, mm-hmm. absolutely. I mean, it's not. It's, there should be a hierarchy of these things. I mean, it's we don't put politics first over theology or over the church any more than, for example, I would put bodily welfare over my soul. Right? That would be out of whack. And so, mm-hmm. it, it's the the hierarchy of our own spiritual values corresponds to the society's hierarchy of values, which should be the spiritual first. And then, yeah. yeah. But within like a Republican system, um, because I, I've read, um, discourses on, Le- uh, Livy by Machiavelli mm-hmm. and he was talking about, okay, I'm, I'm not a fan of Machiavelli obviously, but he did have some points in mm-hmm. talking about how Republican systems can be beneficial in certain circumstances. Mm-hmm. And obviously I know Seraphim Rose and traditional, you know, traditionally in Orthodox countries, you know, symphony, uh, it's monarchy, it's all that. Uh-huh. But is orthodoxy possible in the context of a republic? Because I just think like hypothetically speaking, like America was never really a a never really had a potential for maybe like Hamilton. Hamilton. Um, yeah. yeah. He was he was supportive of it, but I just feel like fundamentally there there are aspects of American society which make it difficult for sure. monarchy to you right. know exist. So my answer would be that the Orthodox Church can exist in any government, but mm-hmm. it's only historically given its seal of approval to monarchy or imperium. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um and second question is related to um so I, I saw in an article on Wikipedia for St. Vincent of Larens, there was a bunch of apparently like Calvinist trolls that called him a semi-Pelagian. Um, is that just a thing they do? Like they accuse people of being semi-Pelagians? And why do they usually accuse Orthodox people of being semi-Pelagians? Because there's a Western uh, dispute that didn't occur in the East. And so uh, the dispute over that was again unique to latin debates and so uh there's a really good lecture that perry robinson did on this topic on the immaculate conception and the, and the or excuse me the perpetual virginity of mary and what's the proper place of mary in orthodoxy so look up perry robinson comma sam shamoon comma uh mary and you'll get that lecture and he covers that very topic uh in in depth in that two-hour talk Awesome. Sweet. Thank you, Jay. Yep. Good questions. Uh, yeah. People in the chat are like, replace the cables. I mean, dude, everything has been replaced. <laughs> it's not the cables. I can see that my upload speeds are like going wild. They'll go from nine to one megabytes per second. So for some reason, ever since the lightning or whatever, knocked the power out, I don't know what it was surge trip to breaker i don't know Uh, ever since then the upload speed goes from nine to one to nine to one to two to seven to two to nine to ten to four i mean it's just crazy and you can see it going on right now i can i can look and see the bit rate and all that right now and it's just ridiculous so uh it literally makes no sense i don't know i have no answer so Rohan Rohan the writers of Roham what's up Roham hello can you hear me yo oh my god dude it's so, it's so nice to talk to you Jay Dyer uh-oh. um I was to ask uh-oh. you so <laughs> uh oh <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. You've influenced me a lot, you know. Now I'm also uh, joining the Orthodox Church near me, a, a catechumen now. So thanks to you, uh, I wanted to ask you. Uh, so this is um, one of the arguments that I've heard um, from Muslims. Like you know, they talk about the incarnation, say that incarnation doesn't make sense because um, it's illogical. And how can, uh, for example, you know, God be limitless because he's a human, or uh, limitless? And limited at the same time. So, how does how do you respond to that? Or let's say, like, are there any well, the, that- Islam doesn't escape any of those objections to their own system. So, if you go watch the debate with uh, Azra Rashid or the debate with Shabir Ali, I bring up all the same objections to them. So, 
I mean, they have the same problem. If, if God is so apophatic that he can't be compared to anything in any sense that's a creature, then none of the words in the Quran tell you anything about Allah and none of the 99 names of Allah tell you anything about Allah. So it's a self-defeating position when they argue in that direction. Right, right. Thank you. Um, also, what are some good books, like let's say, that you would recommend for like um, introduction to metaphysics or, or, or philosophy? Well, if you're wanting to understand orthodox metaphysics, the best book for yeah. that is Yaroslav Pelikan's book, uh, Christianity and the Classical Tradition, The Metamorphosis of Natural Theology in the Cappadocians, because he really just gives uh, an excellent 400-page overview of all of their metaphysics. Next in line would be John Damascus's book, Fount of Knowledge. That would give you a good um, orthodox metaphysic and epistemology. And really anything by St. Maximus, I would say start with the Little Blue St. Vladimir Seminary Press book, uh, Cosmic Mystery. Mm. Also, I had one more question. It's just, um, uh-huh. uh, so it was just the last question. But sure. I also got this Orthodox book. Um, uh, it's called like Unquenchable Fire. It's about like, you know, the traditional teaching on hell. And even uh, the author is Orthodox, even uh, says that, um, at least says that you know Gregory of Nyssa, I think, was like you know going towards universalism or something. Is that true? Right, is but I mean, yeah, but but so any single church father can get this or that doctrine wrong, right? We don't follow every church father and everything, and many of them got many things wrong. So that's why we follow the consensus of the fathers and the ecumenical councils. So yes, the uh, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, I believe, was wrong about that view. Okay, got you. Thank you so much, man. Sure. Yeah, just like we don't follow, you know, Augustine and every one of his views, we don't even follow St. Maximus and every one of his views. So any any in, individual church father uh, is not infallible, but uh, yeah, great questions, dude. Um, All right, also... I'm sorry, I didn't know you were going to ask another one. Uh, Alex, this is uh, our old buddy Ravens on the Wall. What's up, Ravens on the Wall? Hey, buddy. Hey, hey, yeah, say. So- What's up, guys? I hope you're doing well. We're doing oh, good. We How are you? Oh, it's good to be back. Yeah, doing well. I just, um, I'm a little rusty since I've been so busy over the past year, but it, uh, I wanted to get back into some stuff. I uh, wanted to revisit personhood for a second. Okay. Um, and one of the items was, you know, when we talk about, like, the significance of personhood, uh, this also ties into ordinance or things occurring in series outside of time so like earlier in the conversation it was brought up how well we start with personhood right we would say that there's the monarchy of the father Mm -hmm. there's the first cause there's god there's the personhood of god and then things happen after that right Right, this is the distinction between the intra-Trinitarian life and what's called the economia, or God in relationship to the created order. Mm-hmm. Right, and so, and then you have, and, and so you keep going with that series, and you end up with, with a nice porphyrian tree at some point, right? In terms of things existing, and how they're delineated. So, what I'm curious about in that mapping is okay we would also know that okay if things happen in order and they happen in delineation over a porphyrian tree then they would also have an implied hierarchy in terms of their existence so can i make a point here yes so the porphyrian tree we wouldn't begin with the triad the porphyrian tree would apply to the created order because the beginning of the Porphyrian tree is a Janus, right? A substance, Janus, and God is not in any Janus. Okay, right. So the Trinity is outside of whatever is created. Right. I would, in other words, I just I wouldn't say, uh, okay, let me construct everything that is existing under the Porphyrian tree, and I will put as number one uh, the Trinity. You know, the Trinity is not part of that. The Porphyrian tree is just the way St. Maximus uses it, uh, applicable to the created order. And the created order kind of comes forth in this manifold kind of fractal way from God. And it does reflect God, but God is not part of the classifications of the created order. 
Right, that makes sense. Because otherwise, you just do the ADS thing, and that's silly. Yeah, yeah, it would lead to all kinds of different. I mean, really, paganism is basically all premised on God being a feature of the created order in some way. Right. Okay. I see. Okay. So, but, the, but so go ahead if you want. If, I, I was just being precise. Gonna, sorry. No, I was just wanted to be precise. So if you want to, I wasn't trying to deflect or, you know, d- derail. So if you want to continue, no, 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 this is good. Um, no, it's I'm just kind of filling in the gaps as I'm as I'm going. These are just some thoughts I'm having off the cuff. That's all. Um, and I'm just thinking about okay. So if this is how things are ordered in creation. Uh huh. Right. In terms of and, and like with that precision is that, you know, God is not in that free tree. OK, so the created order might reflect him. Got it. So that's right. That don't make sense. So then. But what we would say is that the free tree is hierarchical. Sure. So the things yeah, that yeah. exist in the created order have that relation. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And with those relations, bringing tying this back to personhood, though, um. You know, be, you know, personhood's having that hierarchical relationship as well. Um, I bring this up because tying into it's because I'm not I'm not trained, so I will constantly get fuzzy on what exists and then how we know what exists. So what I mean by that is, in this case, that okay, it's easy for me to understand the created order on a porphyrian tree. And understand that everything exists in a hierarchy structure, but then when we talk about, well, how can we now when we're going to apprehend with our minds to know this tree, we have to do so relationally as a person on that created order, right? And and so what I struggle with is that if what exists has greater significance in a strict hierarchy. You know, in our relationship with Christ, as we so, build that relationship, surely the significance of, of how we apprehend or what we know, you know, in that order would be more significant. And then our apprehension of other things that exist would be less significant, like in a re- in real terms, not just uh, what I care about. Right. Um. So I would say that so the Porphyrian tree is just an, uh, an an example that Maximus appropriates to help explain the structure that exists in the created order. It's not this rigid hierarchy the way that Porphyry thinks it is. Okay, gotcha. So it's just a way to kind of like understand the structure that exists that undergirds the one and the many uh, substance. You know, genera, species, what a what a man is. You know, it's not like a rigid hierarchy by which you come to know things. It's not a. It's just a class. It's just a tool that helps us kind of. Um, I could see that, and I think that I was just trying to suggest the possibility of that, only in the sense that, as a person, we know there's. Mm-hmm. In the sense that it's sure. relational, and that might—I mean, in terms of who we know mm-hmm. and what and what we know—it um, would it would it would seem that well, who we know would matter, especially if one of the who is Christ. So, I guess what I'm saying is that I'm just suggesting that how we apprehend knowledge would have uh this is a really subtle point i guess it's kind of pointless this is i'm sorry but the point is that it's not maybe it's not totally pointless but i guess who we know maybe it also maps onto what we know Mm. and how we know father deacon do you have any comment on this we know right like our, our knowledge of relationships is 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 important as in one of the who is Christ now what I'm suggest that is significant in the sense that it is obviously the most important that we know Christ and that is in real terms more meaningful objectively so than just testing the way in which we you map on to 
who you know is significant to how we map on to any knowledge, not just persons. So I'm suggesting that some bits of knowledge could have more relational importance because in the same way that we know Christ in an objective real in, in objective real terms would be more significant than our apprehension of certain forms of knowledge outside of just personhood would like for example knowing uh i'm gonna say something obvious like in real terms knowing but, and, and that seems obvious when pulled statement about okay what is apprehend then the i mean it sounds strange to put it that therefore our yeah, it's not a clean argument. And I don't know suggest- if I would use the term restrained. Yeah. In fact, I do, you know, and I think Jay does this too. Um, as part of the, a transcendental argument for the existence of... That's a necessary condition for... And people are always asking... So it's it's... It's foundational, not in like a foundationalist epistemology, but foundational kind of in terms of importance and what is uh, uh, antecedent yeah. prior. That's a good good way to put it. Yeah. That um, personhood in you, and so 